Roll call, please. Carr. Cruz. Here. Fox. Here. Frost. Here. Here. Gaylord. Present. Guetta. Here. Hansen. Harris. Here. Kennedy. Lee. Here. Natoli. Peters. Cerna. And Terry. Here. We have a quorum. Okay, with that, we'll move on to the Pledge of Allegiance, which today we'll have led by uh, Director Frost. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So with that, we'll move on to the uh, clerk announcement. This meeting of the Sacramento Metropolitan Air Quality Management District is cablecast live without interruption on Metro Cable 14, the local government affairs channel on Comcast Consolidated Communications and AT&T U-verse cable system. This meeting is being closed captioned and will be webcast at www.sacmetrocabletv. Today's meeting will be repeated on Sunday, October 28th, 2018 at 3 p.m. and Monday, October 29th at 1 p.m. on Channel 14. Members of the audience wishing to address the board should fill out a speaker form located on the table at the back of the chamber and give it to the clerk. Please speak into the microphone when addressing the board and state your name for the record. Also at this time, please silence your cell phones until the conclusion of today's meeting. Thank you, and with that, we'll move on to the Air Pollution Control Officer's report. Dr. Ayala. Give me one second. Can you do it from there? Oh, there, there we go. <laughs> I was getting ready to move. Good morning, board. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, the last meeting of 2018, hard to believe, but uh, I appreciate you uh, making the time for us. Uh, we have a number of items, as is uh, customary, uh, that we want to make you aware of. Uh, today uh, is going to be a bit of a uh, tag team report. I have uh, Mr. Lemos, uh, one of our, um, he's our acting division manager for transportation and climate. Uh, uh, climate Change Division. He's going to help me report on a couple of items of importance uh, because he's actually the one that was point uh, contact on it. Um, and we'll get uh, to that uh, right away. So the first thing is, and um, I would also invite uh, Vice Chair uh, Guerra to chime in as he deems appropriate. The first thing is, as you heard in September, a very important uh, mission that uh, our board members and our staff uh, were on to uh, Germany. So we'll let Mr. Lemos tell us a little bit about it. Good morning. I'm Jaime Lemos, the acting division manager. Uh, is your mic on? Yeah, the mic is not on. Does he Take turn two. it on? Or? It's on. There we go. <laughs> so good morning. My name is Jaime Lemos. I'm the acting division manager for the Transportation and Climate Change Division. So last month during our board meeting, Alberto mentioned that there were a few of us in Germany. The trip was organized by the Greater Sacramento Economic Council's President Barry Broom and Vice President of Business Development Neil Best. Participating was Yvonne Harris, Associate Vice President of the Office of Research Innovation and Economic Development at Sac State, and Michael Hasso, Assistant City Manager of the City of Sacramento. Our, our board members, Phil Serna and Eric Guerra, and myself. The week-long trip consisted of back-to-back -back meetings in Aachen, Hanover, and Berlin. We were hosted by the Production Engineering of E-Mobility, the PEM Group, of the RWTH University of Aachen, Germany, and met with various auto manufacturers, startup companies, potential investors, and visited the International Trade Fair for Mobility, Transportation, and Logistics in Hanover. The purpose was to observe, evaluate, and understand the PEMS innovation and ramp up facility and determine whether this model fits our region. The partnership between PEM, the traditional auto OEMs, and the zero emission mobility starter companies allow collaboration to reduce risk and serve as a catalyst to promote innovation in the mobile sector. So. 
What this could mean for the Sacramento region, the Sacramento Center of Future Mobility would be an innovation center and ramp up factory for Sacramento. This center can connect the academic institutions, the manufacturers, CARB, and our district to drive zero emission and autonomous mobility technology and policy. This is a key component, the opportunity to develop zero emission and autonomous technology in Sacramento, here close to the capital and to ARB, our, our district has the opportunity to drive local, state, and potentially national clean air policy. We had a chance to see many presentations and meet many companies. I was relieved to see that the zero mission and autonomous efforts in Germany are not too far ahead from our own efforts here in California. However, the collaboration between PAM, the university manufacturers, and local government to advance mobility manufacturing workforce and development with clean air goals was very impressive. Well, Mr. Chair, if I could add, um, first of all, thank you. I want to thank um, the Air District and uh, uh, Mr. Limas for, his, for participating in this trip. We had a very targeted group of folks uh, to look at how this could, what this really means for the Sac greater Sacramento region. Um, uh, with Supervisor Phil Cerna, who's also a member of this Air District and also a member of the Air Quality Management District, our econo economic um, uh, uh, chair or the Assistant City Manager in Economic Development for the City of Sacramento, and also the Associate Provost for Sac State, the uh, on the uh, uh, who is looking at economic development for uh, the university and the partners of the university. Um, and obviously Greater Sacramento uh, GSAC with Barry Broom and Neil Best. And what, what I think, and I want to underscore on this little diagram that we have here, it's the success story of a ramp up factory. And there, the uh, PEM, uh, who focuses on not just research, but actually production and getting things up to scale for uh, zero emission technology, zero mobility technology. And it, our mission here in this board is to ensure that we have good air quality, that we maintain a healthy uh, breathing. But for uh, many of us uh, uh, in our respective cities and board of uh, supervisors, our roles are in economic development and ensuring that we have jobs, that we have the future economic prosperity of our cities. And what is exciting about this is, is this institution would like to replicate that public-private partnership with their educational institution in the Sacramento region. And for the purpose of looking at uh, zero emission uh, mobility, for us, I think this is an exciting opportunity because, as Mr. Lima said, we're, we're not that far behind. But it could sp what we saw there was there are a number of spin-off startup companies. Uh, but most importantly, it brought back manufacturing, particularly in a country like Germany, much like the United States, where no one ever thought manufacturing could come, come back to. And they did it through this ramp-up factory style. Um, what the term they called it, I think, was primal style or whatnot. Primal, <laughs> primal we got a kick out of that. But, uh, uh, but for them, uh, I think uh, they're interested in looking at the United States market and particularly Sacramento because the regulators are in Sacramento. Um, the, uh, we have a unique uh, environment where we have both uh, metropolitan, re uh, rural, and suburban, uh, where it could be a testing site for the state. Uh, but most importantly, um, I think this collection of body, and we've, we've seen it when we've gone to cap to cap, it's a combination of local governments that we can work together. And those are the big three pieces. Can the local governments work together? Can the institutions and the, and the universities and the private sector work together? But most importantly, it created true jobs and not just uh, research for the sake of research and prototypes for the sake of prototypes, but actually producing the future of mobility in the region. And I think if we corner the market in Sacramento for uh, e-mobility, uh, we corner the market for the state, and then after that, um, you know, when California sets regulations, the rest of the country follows. Thank you. If I, if I may, um, I just want to put a finer point on, on what Vice Chair Guerra said in terms of why we as a regional air district are investing our time and resources on this. Um, the reason for that is, is, is as follows. There is obviously a role for public policy to promote this sort of development. So obviously for us, we're not necessarily after the brick and mortar development of something and the gizmos that you're gonna make inside. But to the extent that that technology develops zero emission mobility, eventually you're gonna have to take those gizmos and try them out. 
And I'm a strong believer that there is a key formula that involves federal, state, and local policies that can work in concert to promote this sort of development. Because, again, why we're interested in this? Transportation is our biggest source of emissions. We got to electrify as soon as possible. To the extent that there is a technological solution, we can put in place the policies at the local level to promote that sort of development. So somebody like a Ford, like a Volkswagen, major companies can decide to come to Sacramento versus any other city in the US where you could make a brick and mortar sort of thing. The second thing is, maybe we don't have the authority to put some of these, places, some of these policies together. But we should be educating ourselves in terms of, to the extent that we come up with some idea, then we take it to our state body and say, we have the idea for the next rule, the next great policy that is going to come out of the California policy making machine so that we can promote the technology. That is the opportunity for us. That is why we are investing and we're committed. And we welcome the opportunity to engage with GSEC and uh, look forward to more of this. So uh, we just wanted to give you an update. and. Um, uh, we'll bring you more as, uh, yeah. as the uh, information rolls out. And we do a mind meld with some of you who, uh, who went on the trip. <laughs> no, that was good. And you could, uh, if, uh, if, you, if you wanted to follow all of the postings and we did, and, and, and it was in a pretty aggressive schedule. I think we started at 7.30 or 8 a.m. every day, and, and they, we finished up. Uh, the Germans don't mess around. They, were, they had us going till 8 o'clock at night. Yeah. Uh, but... Uh, uh, <coughs> The, uh, the finer point, uh, the, the, the last point, I think, is if we're going to move the needle on air quality, it's, mo it's, it's the non-stationary sources, right? It's all the mobile sources. That, uh, I think we can actually make something important here. And even to Mr. Harris's point, uh, we also looked at some startups that did uh, uh, e-aviation there. And, uh, and they were looking at it uh, from understanding the cost of future roads are going to get more expensive. And at some point, we have to look at what that future is. So, yeah. So again, thank you. One of these days, I hope that we can hear from uh, uh, Director Cerna when he has a chance to join our board and, and get his perspective. Um, I want to move on on the APCO report. The next item that I'd like to uh, make Excuse you me. aware of is, um, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I Director wanted... Frost, sorry. Thank you. Could you just explain the prototype oh, examples? There were a couple on there that I didn't understand what they were. Sure. So. On the, on the top um, blue squares um, is kind of the, idea, the, the innovation center, right? Where OEMs, traditional OEMs and starter companies come up with this idea. And so it's a little too costly for the manufacturers to really fully develop the idea. So they go to the, um, the PEM group and in collaboration with the university students, they allow the university students to problem solve and find a solution for this. They develop a prototype, then the prototype uh, gets tested out uh, within their facilities. Eventually, at some point, they go through the ramping facility process, which means that they go from one prototype to 10 to 50 to 100, eventually to a point to where the, the traditional OEMs or the starter company says, OK, we're good to roll this out into the commercial market. Um, and that's the idea of the prototype development there. So what is the Ford Cart E? Car, Ford car. So, so that was Ford wanting to develop a people mover. Um, uh, someone stands up on that people mover, and um, I, I believe I have a picture of, of Director Guerra on this. Um, so I'll have to share that with everybody. Early version of a hoverboard. It is. Oh, a, wow. It, it is. I wondered what And so was. the prototype examples are um, you have Street Scooter on the far left, which serves really the DHL uh, company, which is a uh, delivery company there in, in, in Europe. Um, you have some smart bikes or electric bikes, and then you have smaller vehicles for passenger vehicles and light duty, and they also do uh, battery manufacturing on site as well. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Well, that was what I wanted to know. What is that? It looks like a box. Yeah. That's a hoverboard. Yeah, it's a, it's a personal hoverboard. Developed uh, by Ford and the PEM Group. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Moving along, um, I'm going to take you on a roller coaster because I'm going to go straight from very good news to very bad news. But again, might as well uh, put it before you. Um, I hope that you heard in the news a couple of weeks ago there was a very important report that came out of the uh, IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. 
And really, this is the, uh, what I call the gold standard of the latest science on climate. I mean, this is um, you know, the, the world's top scientists, 91 in this particular case, 44 countries, multi-year effort. Lots of people looking at the work that they published. And uh, this is really the reference point. When we talk about taking action on climate, low carbon development, we go to this, to this report to get the latest understanding in terms of why the planet has, to, why the world has to change because the planet is in peril. And unfortunately, the latest report uh, is, is pretty grim. I mean, things are, are, are worse than what we, we thought in the last report, and the change, the extreme change in the climate is gonna happen faster than we initially um, anticipated. Um, I will not go into any of detail. For those of you that are interested, they actually include a very um, good, uh, policymaker summary of the report. If anybody's interested, I invite you to, to, uh, to read it. It's only 20 plus pages, very digestible. Uh, but the reason I want to highlight this for you is because uh, this is why it's important for us to take local action and why we need to be leaders in driving low carbon development. Because obviously, as you know, all action is, is local. And we have a role to play in advancing in an economically responsible way um, when we see opportunities for low carbon uh, clean air technology development, this is why we want to do that. So again, uh, what I wanted to alert you to is, is just the fact that this report is out there. And certainly air districts, uh, air agencies in the US around the world are paying very close attention to this process. Mr. Harris. There we go. Uh, Alberto, thanks for bringing this up. You know, uh, you, you just said something that's pretty remarkable. You said the planet is imperiled, and it's actually true. You know, certainly for me, it, it informs everything that I do policy-wise. Last night I was at a community meeting, uh, just local in East Sacramento, and people were querying me about why, why am I allowing um, developments that are under parked? Why are we doing road diets? Why are we redoing things in the city? And I explained, we're trying to change a paradigm here. And I brought this up. I brought up the IPCC. And I said, really, you know, do you want to live or do you want to be able to drive down Folsom Boulevard at your convenience with one person and one car? And I, I just explained, look, it's uncomfortable to change a paradigm. But if we don't take this seriously, we're not going to get to enjoy this convenience of one person in one car for much longer. And I actually think it, it, for the first time, that kind of rhetoric took hold. So maybe the collective consciousness is raising, but I think it's incumbent upon all of us as policymakers to be very mindful of what we're actually facing here. We're facing the future for our kids, mm -hmm. and uh, it's very important. So thanks for bringing this up. Thank you for, for uh, sharing those thoughts. Um, I can tell you from my interaction with my former bosses, the members of the Air Resources Board, they're looking at boards like you because they realize that the solutions are going to come from local entities and regions and cities like those represented on this board. That's why, as you know, um, I feel so passionate about it and I think the whole agency is behind it because the sense of urgency can be much clearer than what's in this report. And to the extent, again, I think uh, Director Frost wanted the report. I'd be happy to uh, send it to you, the, uh, the summary for policymakers um, on this. Happy to expand on this as, as necessary. So moving on. Um, <laughs> we're going from good to bad to good. So here's a, a little bit of hope. Um, I wanted to share with you that uh, we have an ongoing collaboration with our uh, counterparts in the Hong Kong Environmental Protection Department. Uh, why am I saying that? Because I was actually in Hong Kong last week and I wanted to make you aware of that. EPD is the air quality authority under this Chinese structure of a uh, special administrative region. And Hong Kong is um, very much a leader like California and like us in that uh, they're really pushing uh, for the benefit of their citizens. They've adopted many of the tools that California has put in place, emissions models, uh, rules, uh, SIPs, that sort of thing. Um, but they want to do more. Uh, they really want to lead the world, and they are es essentially starting from scratch and developing the next generation models uh, for, for air quality planning for the future. 
but they wanted advice. So they recruited a number of uh, uh, advisory panel members, and they invited us, uh, the Sacramento District, to participate. Very graciously, they provided funding, not only to support travel, but also the time that we had spent on this. Uh, and we're working in partnership with uh, West Virginia University, who's actually the prime, and we are a subcontractor to them. Why well, I tell you this is because, again, this collaboration is going to be very important to us because, again, they are dealing with the same issue we have. Transportation emissions are the biggest thing. They want to protect their citizens from exposure to combustion pollution. So we are bound to learn some really important lessons that even if we as a region, as, a, as, an, as an air district, don't have the authority to implement, we have a responsibility to take those lessons and go talk to our friends at the Air Resources Board. So I hope that you agree with me that this is um, a great thing for us. And again, I just wanted to make you aware that uh, this is an ongoing collaboration. Um, and staying on the good news track, um, another event that- Actually, uh, Director Harris, oh. did you have another question? OK, I'm sorry. Go ahead. So I, I wanted to uh, uh, also uh, address the point that on the idea of Sacramento being both a research and innovation place, we've been getting an interest from um, our folks in, in uh, the East to, that also have an interest in California being kind of uh, a place for them to invest in this type of technology. So I think there's a lot of pieces moving together that that with the effort that uh, uh, Dr. Ayala has been pushing, I think it's not just you know what folks are doing in Europe, but also in Asia are interested in how California is going to start addressing this 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 piece. And some of their delegation was out here. A big delegation was out um, looking at how if Sacramento is going to be that next target. We're ready to do what we can to make that happen. The next item is, again, another event that uh, Mr. Lemos and uh, Vice Chair Guerra uh, were point for, uh, for the Air District. So I'll let them um, uh, share with us some of their observations. Great. So last week, on October 16th through the 18th, our district helped sponsor the NorCal Clean Technology Forum and Expo produced by the East Bay and Sacramento Clean Cities Coalition and the West Coast Collaborative. The event was held at the McClellan Conference Center. The event focused on forums on zero emission mobility, policy, technology, innovation, freight technologies, incentive community, uh, incentives, community air protection, and many more. We, had the privilege of has, we also had the privilege of having Director Serna welcome and open up the expo on Wednesday morning. As always, the event highlights are the zero emission vehicles, ranging from light duty to heavy duty vehicles, Envoy, a car share vehicle, TransTech, a micro school bus, Thor, a class eight tractor truck, an electric yard hustler, BYD electric delivery vehicles, and Danner mobile power station are all up on the, on the screen right now. I wanted to focus a little on the MPS, the Danner mobile power station. It's an electric work vehicle and energy platform that provides multifunction utility for daily off-road maintenance and, en and emergency power for disaster response. The MPS is able to receive a variety of construction add-ons, such as forklifts, excavator, front-end loader buckets, without any modifications. The MPS is available with remote-controlled uh, technology or with an operator platform. As you can see in the picture, Director Guerra had the opportunity to attend and try out the equipment. And here is Director Guerra. Hmm. Oh. Oh. oh, this one is the video. You've got to use the mouse. It's a video, right? Uh, the wheels turn left, right, forward. Oh, oh, that picks up. Yeah, watch out. Okay, I wouldn't, I wouldn't work well with that. This is really exciting because for many years we've been talking about the technology and the innovative technology coming and we've been waiting and waiting and so now here we have these examples of, of zero emission technology in a variety of, of sectors, the light duty sector, the heavy duty sector and in this case even emergency response. And so um, 
you know, Director Guerra, if there's anything you'd like to, to add on to that. Yeah, you know, the other than uh, clearly I, I was never good at remote control vehicles. <laughs> Uh, maybe not even regular ones, but um, the the unique thing about this technology is we had this major fire and disaster in Napa recently, where they lost power, they lost, they couldn't get equipment out. Um, that device there, not only can you add every attachment to it, like you know a, a driller auger, a backhoe, or any kind of any other heavy duty um, uh, equipment, but it also is a major power supply. Uh, I think they could last up to up to three days. Per that, per that one, so that you could chip one in, and and people could tap into it and connect into it. So, there's a unique role in uh, uh, in disaster response, and and not only um, reducing our. Um, our when our heavy duty vehicles have, might be diesel to get you know if we can't get diesel to a location you, you've already got these equipment so it was a unique uh, experience to look at how this technology can help us in disaster response what's the did, did they give you any idea of the, the lifespan of the, the batteries because that always seems to be the the variable here is that uh, you know was it Tesla a hundred thousand miles you're supposed to replace the battery and that's 10 grand or something like that did they yeah. give you any indication on this type no, of equipment? No, we haven't discussed exactly um, their battery life and technology. However, they, they did stand behind being able to serve as, as emergency response um, for three days at a time and, and be very reliable. Um, and I think the back part of that, what you see on that MPS, is actually the battery pack. That so, whole thing, wow. Yeah, so um, I think, in, in my opinion, I think a half of the cost of that vehicle would probably be that battery, that battery itself. Uh, that you vehicle can, looks like it's a battery. Yeah, you can um, add up to uh, two massive batteries um, in, in configurations where you have one in the front and one in the back and then be operated by remote control to, to really have high capacity. Uh, Director Carr had a question. Yeah, Eric, how close do you have to be to operate the remote control on that thing? Do you have to uh, maintain you, the closeness? You know, when, they, when the operator was operating it at the first time, he was almost all the way to the... Um, to the building, uh, pretty far back out. So if you were in a in a dangerous area, you could also send that that down into a place where maybe you don't want a human person operating some heavy equipment. But you can be in the cabin. You can also be in the cabin too. You so can it can be managed in the cabin, around. but you can also manage by control. Yeah, my car will do that too. In fact, I used it to park because the parking places are so tight. Mm -hmm. But you have to be fairly close uh, mm -hmm. to the car in order to use the remote. Yeah. I think that you know a lot of this technology is still advancing. The battery technology is advancing. Um, you know, when when we get to scale on this stuff, it's going to be some unique opportunities for us. Perfect segue, if I may, because uh, just a couple things. This is the reason why we've been so aggressive, and with your help, we're going to do everything we can to attract more cap and trade dollars to the region. Because if we can do that then we will be in a position to invest in this kind of solution for our businesses in the region. So this makes it real in terms of when you hear us talk about investments and incentives, this is the reason why. Because if we don't have the cap and trade dollars, this is all good for you know dog and pony show, but there's, there's no real benefit. The second thing is battery technology is advancing and is going to become a real solution. It already is a real solution. Don't forget, electric vehicles come in a different flavor. There is the fuel cell technology that could be a solution as well. And that is, as you have heard me say before, another priority for us. Because I do think that regionally we need to make a big play on hydrogen because in many instances, because as you noted here, maybe the battery is not the right solution. Maybe it's a fuel cell stack. And it exists. So another priority for us. Um, so thank you. The last, uh, the last item I have on the APCO report is simply a verbal uh, notice that I'd like to share with you all, particularly those of you that sit on the Sacramento RT board. Um, as you know, the, uh, the SAC RT has been undergoing an optimization uh, a project. Uh, you are going to be convening, convening along with the rest of the board members on November 12th to hear the latest results from the optimization project. And we are anticipating uh, making public comment at that, at that meeting. 
Uh, and I want to share with you, again, particularly for those of you that are going to be uh, participating in that discussion, we will be uh, putting together some uh, talking points and comments that we want to share with you. So, so you know what we're going to say, and you're going to see a memo from the clerk, as you normally see with those points. The reason I'm bringing this up is because, again, I'm not gonna see, we're not going to see you uh, before you have that meeting. And clearly, uh, the position that the district, from an air quality and low carbon development standpoint, is the emphasis uh, from our perspective has to be on ridership, right? We've got to get people out of the cars and into the, into the buses or any other alternative mobility. So again, I don't want you to be surprised when you are deliberating the item and you hear a comment from us. OK, that's the APCO report. Quick question, Mr. Chair. Uh, you mentioned that SMUD had adopted a net zero by 2040. Exactly what does that mean? Not sure. Thank you for noticing that. Um, I reported to you uh, before, and D uh, Director Carr missed the uh, September meeting. Thank you. You were doing a very important thing for us, and we'll get to it in a minute. Um, SMOD has been also a leader in the region in terms of really embracing the opportunity to go to net zero carbon. Uh, and what the SMOD board has done is really stepped up to do more faster than what the state is doing. And they basically adopted a net zero carbon goal for 2040. Now, you got to step back and think about this. This is a major electric utility, the sixth largest in the US. And they just committed to get us to zero carbon in 2040. So clearly, that is very important for us, because when we deploy this kind of technology, we got to make sure that the electrons that go into it are zero carbon electrons, not coal-based electrons, for sure. So that was the action that uh, the SMART board uh, took. Uh, we were there to provide testimony. Actually, it was Mr. Lemus again who uh, provided the testimony. And we are growing the partnership with SMART because clearly they have a mandate and interest uh, to deploy uh, electrification of transportation, which is very much in line with what we want to do. I understand. But what does net zero mean? That means there is uh, no carbon, no CO2 emissions uh, from generation of uh, electricity. And the reason they call it net is because if you do end up burning fossil fuel to generate electricity, you will be offsetting it by doing something else that negates the CO2 produced. Okay. So it's essentially a, a technical term, but the impact is net zero carbon, which is really what the planet cares about. The planet doesn't care where it comes from, as long as we don't emit it. OK, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Dr. Howe? Okay. With that, we'll move on to the consent calendar. These are deemed routine and non-controversial. Um, is there anything that needs to be pulled? No. Do we have any comment? No, we do not. Okay. I'll move consent. I have a second. motion by Gara. Do I have a second? A second. A second by Harris. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposition? Abstentions? Calendar carries. Okay. We'll move on to public hearing items. Um, Item number nine, adopt amendments to rule 414. And I'm not going to read the rest of that. Because <laughs> there's a whole bunch of stuff in there. Go ahead. Uh, good morning, Chair Terry and members of the board. My name is Mark Gooley, and I work in the rules development section at the district. I am here today to present amendments to rules 414 and 419. These rules apply to small boilers and water heaters and larger industrial combustion units, such as dryers, Ovens, kilns, and asphalt plants. Oh, sorry. As you know, the district is responsible for adopting and amending rules as needed. Because the district does not meet health standards for ozone, adopting and amending rules, such as the amendments to rules 419, reduces emissions, which helps to reduce the formation of ozone. In addition, the district is required by federal and state requirements to reduce emissions and analyzing requiring cleaner technology for new and existing sources. Also, when appropriate, as in the amendments to rules 414, the district will reduce burden to sources. What do these co rules cover already? Well, rule 414, again, applies to small boilers and hot water heaters. You'll typically find these in homes, hotels, schools, and office buildings. Um, a typical home hot water heater is about 100,000 BTU. A larger industrial one, shown here, can range up to about a million BTU. This rule contains emission limits for these devices. 
Rule 419, as it was adopted in July of this year, currently applies only to major stationary sources of NOx. The amendment today will apply the applicability of that rule to non-major stationary sources um, that have units rated 5 million or BTU or greater. Uh, this amendment was taken in two parts in order to meet EPA timelines, and today we're back again to amend the rule. So how are emissions created from these units? While the burning of natural gas and diesel fuel emits NOx and other pollutants. The use of low NOx burners, shown here in the bottom left, uh, reduces the amount of emissions created when burning fuel. And one method of compliance with this pr proposed rule is to use low NOx burners. As mentioned, the amendment to Rule 414 reduces the burden to sources. Hot water pressure washers, illustrated here in the upper right, are proposed to be exempt from the rule requirements. These units were not previously identified, and other districts have exempted these hot water pressure washers recently from their rules. Uh, the reason for this is there's a lack of compliant equipment available today, and they're limited use type of units that are not operated very often and for very long. The amendment to 419 is a second part of the adoption. As mentioned, the rule is adopted in July to meet requirements. Uh, staff took additional time to address some industry comments that we received at a workshop in June. And the proposed rule will meet the state requirements that were identified earlier. Uh, no additional units are subject to 414, so I'll now focus on the sources that are subject to 419. Um, there's 14 sources with a total of 19 permitted units that are subject to the rule. Uh, these units range anywhere from just over 5 million BTU up to uh, 135 million. Um, the larger units are located at asphalt plants, and the smaller units are manufacturing facilities uh, and industrial bakeries. Uh, 12 of the 19 units were identified by staff to potentially not meet the proposed standards. Um, these units may potentially need to be uh, upgraded or replaced with new equipment to use low NOx burners to meet the requirements. Uh, and the staff also identified what the potential costs were and included those into the analysis of the rule. Uh, here is a map showing where the affected sources are located. As you can see, the sources are spread throughout the county. Uh, and the amendment to Rule 414 will forego some emission reductions, which are offset uh, by the amendments to Rule 419. Um, the amendments to 419 are about five and a half tons per year. Um, these are significant reductions, uh, but affect far fewer sources than a previous amendment to the boiler rule, which was much larger reduction, but again, it affected a lot of units. This rule only affects a few. Um, the overall cost effectiveness, based on staff's analysis, including those costs mentioned, was about $7.66 per pound of NOx reduced. Um, compared to other district rules, this is less than previous ones. Staff finds the proposed rules are exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act um, as an action uh, for the protection of the environment, and there's no possibility of a significant adverse effect on the environment. Uh, consistent with prior rules, staff conducted the outreach shown here. Um, staff worked very closely with the potential sources, uh, contacting each one directly since there was uh, just a few sources uh, impacted. Um, and we also published notices in the B and sent notices to those who signed up for notifications. And staff's recommendation is for the board to conduct a public hearing, determine the amendments to the rules are exempt from CEQA. Staff recommends the board adopt the resolutions approving the rules and forward those materials to California Air Resources Board for inclusion into the state implementation plan. That, uh, this is a public hearing, right? So let me open the public hearing. Do we have any public comment on this? We do. I have Miss Becky Wood with Tykert. Okay. Good 
Good morning, board. My name is Becky Wood, and I'm the environmental manager for Tykert Materials. We have three units that are affected by this rule, and we have worked with staff to address some of our concerns with the way the rule was originally written, and we are in support of it. I will just, one clarifying comment, just based on, on the presentation that was just made. This rule was originally in a SIP that came out a couple of years ago, and it was removed uh, before the SIP was adopted. And where you say adopting this rule would have no possible uh, environmental impact is not true because it wasn't adopted in the SIP for the entire non-attainment region. Someone could set up an asphalt plant that met um, higher emission standards just across the county line in like South Sutter County uh, and there would be additional truck emissions from, from such a location uh, to meet the market demand. So uh, while we support this rule, have no problem with it, we really would prefer to see it get into the SIP and become a standard for the entire region to keep the playing field level and make sure that some of those impacts uh, don't happen. So that's my only comment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Director Carr had a comment? Uh, <clears throat> not a comment, a question. Sure. Uh, the map with the sources, I'm sorry. Yeah. The map that you displayed with the sources, do you have anything more definitive? I'd like to know uh, in my district for sure if there are sources, because I'm probably going to hear from these people. Uh, yeah, I can. I have a map here with all the sources on it. I can give that to you after. Or um, yeah, we probably all would like to see it. Yeah, I, I can send that out. I have a list of sources I can send out to. Um, if you want, I can go over each one on the map right no, now. But if, if you just send it to us, it'd okay. Be okay. And, and Perhaps a message, can you just give the Board a general sense in terms of the l nature of the interaction we've had with the sources? Uh, yeah, with, with each of these sources, uh, we talked to them on the phone. Um, we visited several of the sources, uh, working with them over the last year or so. Um, so all of them should be aware of it. Again, uh, seven of the sources are already compliant right now, um, and the rest are, are, are more than aware of it. I, I guess I want to make sure that Bourne understands this. Um, have, you, have we heard of any issues with the sources? No. Right. That's the key issue, that we've been working with the sources. They understand the rule is coming, but we've been interacting with them so that the impact is, is not going to lead to any issues. And you know, the clarification provided by Tiger is a point well taken. Director Harris. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just addressing the comment by Ms. Wood from Tigert, I appreciate that you're supportive, and I understand completely that you know, when you make rules locally, it, this is a common complaint that when we take an action that people will cross a county line, uh, that we need to level the playing field uh, or, or amongst the whole region. You have to start somewhere, however, and these kind of uh, rules adoptions do spread, and I, I do anticipate that it will reach a wider geogra uh, geographical area as a result of this action. I don't know, I'd actually like to ask our director, Ayala, if he, if he concurs with that idea. I'm gonna let uh, Mr. Uh, Mark Lutzenheiser, the uh, division manager for planning to uh, address your question and then the, uh, the point made by, uh, by Tiger. Thank you, Mark Lutzenheiser, division manager, program coordination division, also including overseeing the rules. Um, in answer to your specific question, Director Kennedy, yes, typically you do find, I'm sorry, my apologies. I'm looking in the Kennedy one was right in line. I should have known better. <laughs> uh, so Director Harris, and thank you for that correction. The, yes, typically we do find that there is the similar following in the other areas. More specifically to Tykert's question on that, one of the things that's going to be coming up, obviously, and we've talked about this a little bit before with this board, is there was the recent adoption of the 2015 ozone standard, which will require the region as a whole to go through another SIP analysis for that ozone standard. It is very likely that, once again, this rule and the impacts of it will be one of the considerations under the SIP. 
The one other thing that does happen for new sources when they go in, and maybe to back up just one second, this particular rule is what's called a, a, a retrofit rule, meaning we look at the cost of implications are looked at a little bit differently when you're requiring an existing facility to make changes versus when you, we talk about best available control technology or backed, which is what is applied when you have a brand new operation coming in. And typically backed is even more stringent than when we go through on a retrofit rule like this one. So if there were a new operation that was going in in an adjoining district and both from a competition standpoint and just a regional air quality perspective, they will have to be as clean as this rule at a minimum uh, and possibly even more stringent than what this rule requires because if we're already able to require this from a retrofit standpoint, then the expectation is that is sort of the floor, if you will, for a new operation going in. Along those lines, you'll hear a little bit more loosely touching upon this when we give you an update on AB 617, the Community Air Protection Program. One of the element of requirements that came out of that program was a statewide update to the clearinghouse on both backed and barked requirements. And certainly rules like ours are going to be part of that determination. So if there was new competing businesses going in with similar equipment, they'd have to be meeting this level of emission reduction or cleaner um, going in. Thank you. That's a great clarification. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Okay. Let me go ahead and close the public hearing. I'll take the motion from Harris and the second from Gara. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposition? Abstentions? Okay, motion carries. That was nine. Now we're moving on to discussion calendar items. Um, I just want to remind staff, um, I think we have a couple of uh, board members that are going to be in the budget committee that have a hard stop at 1030. So these next two items we, we do need to dispense with fairly quickly. Thank you. Uh, so with that, we'll move on to item 10, which is update on Sacramento Regional Transit new micro transit programs. So as Mr. Um, Alsh is uh, making his way to the podium, I'll introduce the item. This is a question that Director Fox asked us to come back on. We introduced this about a couple of months ago, and it's a very exciting project for us, and we're very pleased to be working with Mr. Alsh and his organization. So rather than us giving you the update, we, uh, we went directly to uh, the one that is making things happening on the ground. So trying to, yeah. Uh, good morning, Chair uh, Terry and Vice Chair Guerra and members of uh, Air Quality Management District. I'm Nathan Olson. I'm the Executive Director of the Franklin Boulevard Business District, also the Executive Director of the Franklin Neighborhood Development Corporation in South Sacramento. Uh, we serve 600 businesses, 160 property owners, 7,000 employees, and have about seven, or I'm sorry, excuse me, 10,000 residents that live in our area. We are a predominantly low-income, disadvantaged community. Uh, looking for ways to serve both for economic prosperity initiatives, but also to lower greenhouse gases and improve the lives of our community and the health there, thereof. Um, perfect. So this is a quick update as requested. Uh, coming back, we have hit a peak of about 138 riders. I should preface this with the fact that I do not serve or represent RT. Uh, however, we are a strong partner in this endeavor to be sure that we provide most uh, available mobility options for our community. Um, so as we're moving forward, we are looking at um, an increase in ridership, specifically um, the, the boon of our uh, endeavor here is the fact that we're using more of the app than we are phone calls, which reduces the stress on the call centers and actually provides us uh, an educational moment for the community that we serve, which is predominantly, once again, low income, but more specifically Latino. We have 48% Latinos specifically in our district, not counting that further of South Sacramento, for example, in Councilmember Carr's district, um, where there's a predominant um, Asian Pacific Islander and or African American community as well. So as we're moving forward, I am not representing you either, Councilmember Carr, but I do want that to be stated that it's serving not just Franklin Boulevard, but other parts of South Sacramento. The trends that we do notice, however, also are the fact that people are connecting to other nodes of transportation, which is exactly what we want, is people to connect from the bus routes to uh, light rail specifically and or other modes of uh, transportation as noted before. Um, what we are looking at, and I'll get into this a little later, are other uh, implementation strategies such as bike share, the jump bike for example, uh, coming south of Sutterville, um, and uh, as well as car share, et cetera. So um, we are seeing a surge once again in the ridership. We uh, assume that that will continue. We do have huge marketing outreach. Um, I didn't bring copies, but this is one of the items that we do post up in the business districts. 
um, specifically on Franklin Boulevard. This one is in Spanish because of the constituents that we serve uh, in our district, but we also have other partnerships, uh, which include the other PBIDs in South Sacramento, such as Mac Road, Florin Road Partnership, uh, La Familia Counseling Center, one of our most prominent and uh, service-oriented community-based organizations, as well as the um, Asian, um, excuse me, uh, Asian Resource um, as well. Um, North City Farms, the neighborhood association that we serve as well, MLK Avenue, Southland Park Neighborhood Association, Sacramento Children's Home, and uh, we also put this out in the events that we serve um, for our community as well to let them know that this is transpiring. Uh, the biggest barrier that we have is actually the educational component of allowing people to know that this is available. Um, there's a huge uh, upfront cost, if you will, in terms of the labor and getting the word out there. Also, obviously, the cost of the materials that we put out. But we're trying to figure out ways to get that information out, so Facebook groups, for example, or El Face, as we call it in, in Spanish, um, but also looking at other modes that we can get the word out there. So um, we're looking at putting a radio ad out on, uh, on a Spanish radio station here in the next few weeks as well to let people know about uh, microtransit and specifically the uh, other modes of transportation for our folks. That said, we have several other current investments along Franklin Boulevard and in South Sacramento. So um, to Councilmember Harris's point, we are looking at uh, complete streets, so road diet, if you will, looking at the implications of that specifically for not only the business community, but for our neighborhoods as well and the communities that we serve. Walkability is a core component to reducing greenhouse gases and specifically um, allowing people to ride their bikes um, in our district. So along with microtransit, uh, we do have complete streets. That's a $20 million project that we're looking at. We've applied for about $11 million this year. Hopefully we'll get it. And then we were awarded recently the TCC planning grant, which is a transformative climate communities allowing us uh, to be able to provide a planning document, what we're calling the Franklin Playbook, and allowing us to be able to look and identify opportunities, funding, and partners for the initiatives that we plan uh, to implement in partnership with the Air Quality Management District and other government agencies. Um, that said, uh, just really quick, once again, some of the other mobility options we're looking at uh, to reducing um, carbon.